everybody. Welcome to the November meeting of the Conradina chapter of the Florida Native Plant Society. I'm Carol Hebert. I'm the current president of the Conradina chapter. And on behalf of all of our Conradina officers and board members, we hope that everyone is staying healthy and safe. We usually, of course, have our meetings in the Melbourne Library, but that whole, uh, with this epidemic going on, that meeting room uh, is closed up to only about 10 people. And of course, our meetings get as many as 50. So uh, we're doing this all online right now. Um, so please be sure to check with our website. It's called the Conradina.FNPS Chapters. Dot org, And you can even see um, who's coming up as our next speakers and what's happening, uh, looking around for different nurseries that are available that are selling native plants and a, a whole bunch of things. So be sure to check our website out. Um, we have just survived our 11th annual native plant garden tour with landscaping with Florida natives. And of course, it was all virtual, so it's all online. Um, went really well. We're really tickled. We had a lot of good comments. Um, and again, this is something you can go back and look at because we do now have Conradina Grandiflora is our YouTube site. So go to YouTube and see what you can type in for Conradina, and it should come right up. And then you can pick the different houses that you saw, um, even has the um, Barrier Island Nature Center and a couple of different things on there. Even our first speaker, Kate Wells, is on there as well. So please visit, visit, visit. Um, we have a storm outside, don't we? I hear a little bit of, of wind and rain. Uh, last Sunday, um, of course, that's yesterday, it was raining and windy. And we tried to go down to have a weeding day down at Ballard Park, which is a beautiful location. Ballard Park is located at 924 Thomas Barber Drive in Melbourne. It's a city of uh, Melbourne's park uh, just south of Sarno, just off US 1, just south of Sarno. And um, it goes all the way down to the Indian River Lagoon and it's, it's um, the Ballard Park. And we have a little spot down there, a beautiful garden with native plants and it needs some weeding. And it was just crazy windy and wet yesterday. So next Sunday, the November 15th, please join us. We could use some help doing some weeding down at Ballard Park. Starting about nine o'clock, go until noon. Uh, looks great, weather looks perfect so far. So who knows, we'll keep our fingers crossed. Um, but we're gonna be doing some Ballard, just some weeding at Ballard Park this coming Sunday, November 15th. And of course, you know, garden tools, gloves, kneeling pads, a hat, some water, all of those things to help beautify our garden. So we hope to see you there. Florida Native Plant Society does promote the preservation, the conservation, and the restoration of native plants and native plant communities of Florida. And we have a wonderful amount of help, all volunteers. So I want to just always say the words of our board members and our officers. I'm Carol Hebert, the current president. Joe Sarmiento is our vice president. Jane Higgins is our treasurer. Catherine Mary is our secretary and a wonderful amount of board members. Suzanne Valencia, Martha Stewart, and as I always say, of course, it's our Martha Stewart. Um, Sharon Dolan, Bo Platt, Jim Baldwin, Karen Moser, Dave Zeiss, Carl Weinbarger, Linda Garassi, Leonard McRae, Stuart Weimer, Sarah Morrison, and Cami Donaldson. Great team. Thank you so much, guys. Um, before we get started with this uh, um, speaker, I just want to get you ready for next month, December. 
Uh, we're so sad that we're not doing our wreaths that we always do every every uh, holiday December meeting. We make wreaths with all kinds of native plant cuttings, but we can't really interact yet. So um, we are going to have Nicole Perna. Uh, she's from Barrier Island Nature Center and Barrier Island Sanctuary, and she's going to be showing her own yard. And so this will show how you know she loves her own yard that way. Um, so she also has a business called Go Native Landscaping. So she will be our December meeting. Uh, that is on the 14th of December, again at six o'clock. We just try to start on time. Um, and you can always check our website. I'm going to say it again. It's conradina.fnpschapters.org. And that way you can see who's coming up in the future as well. So as you go to our website, you will notice that there are other sources of business that have native plants for sale and for insulation. And so I'm really lucky tonight to be able to introduce uh, Brendan Skip Haley, who is our guest speaker tonight. Hey, Brendan, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm great. I'm great. I'm going to call you Skip, though. That's what Please. most people do. I don't want to be too official. <laughs> he's the owner of Change of Greenery, and he's going to be talking about just what we all want to hear is turf replacement or turf alternatives. So um, it's going to be fantastic. So I'm going to go ahead and do a little introduction, Skip, and then let you take over. Sure. All right. So Skip specializes in creating lagoon-friendly landscape designs and installing them. Skip is a Brevard County native and earned a bachelor's degree in agribusiness agri with a horticulture minor in, at M Mississippi State University. He's worked in greenhouses and garden centers across the state, including Epcot's The Land Pavilion. His education and industry experience brought him to start a landscape firm with the purpose of installing Florida native and edible landscapes. He focuses on providing habitat to native pollinators and wildlife through sustainable approach and lagoon friendly planting. And his goal is to preserve Florida's natural beauty. So I'm gonna let you take it over uh, and let you talk about your turf alternatives. All right, thank you, Carol. Thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Um, as Carol mentioned, my name is Skip Healy uh, with Change of Greenery LLC. Um, we install native landscapes all over Brevard County, everywhere from Titusville down to Mico. Um, and we like to think that we have a little bit of a technique that shows that native plant uh, installations can be aesthetically pleasing and functional for the homeowner. So um, without any further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. So some of the benefits of reducing turf, um, we all live in an area where we have an impact on our lagoons. Um, using turf, it requires a lot of things, not just fertilizer, but pesticides. It requires a lot of irrigation. Um, but really the issue with the high phosphorus amounts that you need to pump into St. Augustine turf to, to keep it going are very detrimental to the lagoon and, and to the runoff. We're all connected to the same watershed. Um, all of our gutters at the end of our driveways end up in storm drains. Those storm drains uh, eventually end up in the same watershed. So everything from picking up your dog's mess in the yard to uh, washing your car in your driveway, everything's connected to that same watershed. So habitat loss. So a lot of these newer developments, when uh, they clear cut for these properties and just put sod back in um, and very little plant material, uh, they're kind of creating a monoculture, um, which isn't sustainable to habitat, um, to wildlife. So the more plant material, the more variety of plant material and having a diverse plant palette can really increase your habitat that you bring into your yard. 
Um, a lot of our native pollinators, they, they look for stuff that's on the ground because many of our native bees live in the ground. So um, there's nothing really beneficial for sod, with sod for them. Um, water use, it's really important uh, here in Florida. So um, about 100 square feet of turf takes about 62 gallons of water to create that one inch watering depth. So over time in using native plants versus turf, you are going to be saving a lot in the water department and in your wallet. And of course, maintenance. Uh, no one really likes mowing their lawn. I mean, I've heard some people say they do, but I don't believe it. Um, so having to pay for a lawn service or having to do it yourself as well as pay and apply pesticides and fertilizer that, again, isn't ideal for our lagoon. In this picture here, you see uh, a nice grouping of frog fruit and railroad vine. We'll touch on both of those ground covers, um, but this is on the on a canal connected to the Indian River Lagoon. <clears throat> All right, this is another uh, site on the Indian River Lagoon in Melbourne. Um, one of the native ground covers we're going to talk about first is often people's favorites. Uh, this is Sunshine Mimosa, Mimosa strigolosa. Um, Sunshine Mimosa is a very interesting ground cover. It has that fern-like foliage to it um, that is sensitive to the touch. Um, there are other species within this genus that are a bit more sensitive to touch, uh, but this one, it does fold up its leaves when you walk on it a little bit. This nitrogen fixing, so that's something that uh, a lot of people that are into planting fruit trees and, and things like that might take in is that you know, this plant is going to produce more nitrogen in the soil for your other plants around it. So it definitely uh, helps the other plants in the system. Um, it's very good for a ground cover that you want light to moderate foot traffic on. Um, you can walk on it, your dogs can walk on it, they can run on it. Um, very pollinator friendly, it gets that nice little pink powder puff flower on it uh, that opens in the morning. Um, so it's one of the first things that the pollinators go to. This ground cover does have a tap root on it, so I wouldn't really want to plant it anywhere near like a drain field or a septic tank, uh, but it is a great ground cover that loves that sandy soil and it will tap right into it. Um, that makes it a little bit more drought tolerant. So, uh, but sandy soil, well drained, full sun, and uh, it really takes off. It's one that you could maintain by weed whipping off of your sidewalks, off of your driveways, etc. But as far as height goes, it really doesn't get too high. So you may mow it just depending on the neighborhood you live in or your neighbors, but for the most part, it's, it's fairly carefree. All right, so this is one that I mentioned in the uh, introductory slide there. This is frog fruit, also known as turkey tangle. Uh, there's another couple of fun uh, common names for it, but Phylonotiflora. So uh, you can see the little white matchstick flowers that this that this ground cover has. So another one that the pollinators really gravitate towards. It fills in nice and lush, um, but this is one that if you never touched it, it could get roughly about a foot tall. And if you had other plants around it, it would use those plants kind of as a, a crutch. It would, it would want to climb up them a bit. So this one versus Sunshine Mimosa may need a little bit more care in the weed eating department. Um, you can mow it if you wanted to as well. Kind of, again, just kind of depends on the situation of your own uh, neighborhood and things like that. So this is a host plant to the white peacock butterfly. Um, oftentimes you'll find frog fruit work its way into mixed lawns or mow what you grow lawns. And uh, it's one of the things that you'll find pollinators on the most, but that white peacock butterfly, oftentimes you'll see that flying low around the lawns. It's usually looking for that host plant for that phylonotiflora. So this one is soil versatile. Um, it can do, a, yes. We do have a question about mimosa. And it doesn't get to be a thick carpet and very sparse. And she lives in Indian Harbor Beach, but not on the ocean. Do you have any ideas why it is not a thick carpet out on the beach side? Um, I, don't, I don't think the beach side has much to do with it. I think it's more probably the microclimate within your yard. Um, it is, you know, best in, in full sun. Um, 
And, you know, it could be something – it does have a little bit of seasonality to it now. So both of these have a little bit of seasonality. So right now um, it's not going to be pumping out foliage like it would during the spring and summer. Um, so that, that could be the case. Um, the other thing is the sun is further south in the winter. So if there's a, um, let's say, a live oak or something that's just on the other side of it, that could be blocking out some of the light right now. But um, and this uh, and again, we talked about monocultures in the first slide. So not all of these plants need to just be out there on their own necessarily. Um, you may find that other ground covers worked in with your sunshine mimosa or your frog fruit might help as well. Um, for some of those times of the year where it might not be as full. Um, and just a side note for everybody, uh, I can't see anything in the sidebar, um, just to let everybody know. So Carol will just, you know, pause me uh, whenever we need to stop and, and ask some questions, but I'd be happy to answer a bunch at the end as well. Um, unfortunately, all I can see, I can't see any of your beautiful faces. All I can see is this uh, PowerPoint screen in front of me. So uh, I'll just keep chugging along and then you, you let me know if we need to hold up. Yes, thank you, thank you, really, um, they were just asking, I had another question too on the one you're, you're uh, highlighting right now is your frog fruit. And uh -huh. they were just curious how high it got. And I know you're talking about ground covers, but I'm going to let you answer that, asking for the height of... Sure, uh, sure. Yeah, I, I mentioned this um, in, in the slide, but if you never touched it, it could get about a foot high, but you can maintain it very easily um, like you would with uh, other turf, essentially. So using a weed eater to keep it off of the off the driveway, off the sidewalk. Um, and then if you needed to control the height, you can mow it and you can weed eat it. Um, but if it was never touched, it could get a foot high. Um, it could even get higher if it had a plant to crutch on because these plants, the mosa and the phyllonotiflora, the frog fruit, are growing on a rhizome above the ground, so a modified stem. So as that stem pushes out, it's going to push out leaves and so mm -hmm. on and so on. So if it runs out of room to crawl on the ground and root in the ground, and runs into a um, cocoa plum, it's going to climb up that cocoa plum a little bit until it, you know, hits the sun, basically. So, um, so does it or drop? Soil? I'm sorry, I, I think you cut out there a little bit. Does the frog like it a bit moist or do they mind dry soil? They don't mind dry, but it would probably prefer to be on the irrigated to um, at least mulched side. You know, if it, if it had a little bit of moisture retention, that's good. Oftentimes you find it growing, um, you know, in a, an area that would be like between a sidewalk and the street where it's kind of more of a mixed lawn and things like that. But if it's on its own, um, it, can, it can take a little wetter foot than like the sunshine mimosa would. Um, I don't. I wouldn't flood either one. Obviously, the mimosa is going to like a more drained soil than the frog fruit would. Um, but you know, it kind of all depends on that microclimate within your yard as to what's going to work the best, light wise, soil wise, and your irrigation that you have or don't have. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Sure. And uh, on that note, you know, you can see this frog fruit here in the picture. It's in a little more shaded area and it's still pretty lush. Um, whereas the mimosa would be a little bit patchier. But again, both have a little seasonality to them. So you might find that some points of the year, your mimosa looks great and other times of the year, it's it's not as good. So, um, all right, we'll, we'll move on to the next one. So this is twin flower, um, Dyscharistae oblongifolia or Humistrata, two different species. Um, like if you were in a, a beachside community, I would probably push the oblongifolia uh, versus the Humistrata. Humistrata likes a little bit more of a wet foot. Um, these again are pollinator friendly. They have a tiny little purple flower on there um, and it's the host for the common buckeye butterfly. These ground covers are uh, not very salt tolerant, but I have planted them beachside um, as long as it's not direct ocean spray or moderately to direct. So um, if it's, every yard has its own little nooks that you can find and, and work with the native plants. Um, this one can do a lot more shade than the last two could. So if you have an area that's quite a shady area under an oak tree or, um, you know, in a more of a dappled light situation, this would probably be the ground cover that I would recommend for you. And again, there's two uh, species that you might find 
readily available at native nurseries. All right, so here we have a, a mama and a baby calf here in the canal near the Indian River Lagoon. Uh, munching on some railroad vine and some sea purslane. So you can see the railroad vine has those big leaves on it. The plant that's kind of growing up underneath, I wish I had a better shot of it, is sea purslane. Uh, this is one that it uh, is also edible to the manatees. Uh, they like the edible tip to the leaves, but humans can eat it, eat it as well if you were so inclined. I know it's a pandemic, so uh, you never know. Uh, but it's a great sand stabilizer, so great for erosion control in houses near the canals um, or just on the lagoon itself. Um, it can take an occasional flooding, uh, but it can take a really dry setting as well. Um, it can be on the dune, you know, and so you can think about how dry that can be. Very salt tolerant. Um, if you eat the leaves, they actually taste quite salty. Um, and it can do full sun or it can do a little bit of light shade. You can see here, this is just getting a little bit of shade from a live oak tree right next to it. So um, this isn't one that I would use as a necessarily like a turf replacement. Um, this is going to be one that, you know, if you have an area, if you're coastal, really, this is going to be where you're going to use it. Um, it can make a nice ground cover for a bed that doesn't have foot traffic or um, right on the canal, right on your coquina rock wall or whatever you have is uh, your bank. So we have railroad vine here. We just saw it um, getting eaten by those manatees. Um, so this is in the same family as morning glory vines, as uh, the moonflower, sweet potatoes. It's the Ipomoea um, genus. So it's it's fairly large genus, but this is a plant that you'll see right on the dunes, um, kind of stabilizing the dunes. So this again has a tap root, has a nice thick stem to it as well. So it uh, really helps hold those dunes together and tap in. Has a nice showy foliage though, uh, fairly large, I'd say about three inches long to about an inch and a half, two inches wide. Um, and the flowers are the same shape that you would see on like a, a morning glory or like a moon flower, uh, kind of a, almost like the color of, of this bar right here. So it's a, it's a nice showy flower. So the pollinators do enjoy that. Um, great sand stabilizer and dune stabilizer. This is on a seawall in Melbourne. Um, and it can take that flooding too if the lagoon reaches a, a high water level. It's very salt tolerant. Um, so this plant is ideal for the dune basically. So um, this plant wouldn't be one that I would plant, you know, in a area that's gonna be really close to foot traffic or traffic for that matter. Um, it is an aggressive grower. Uh, so it will, you one vine could get 30 feet long if you let it um, and it can be a little bit high maintenance in that regard but if you have it in an area where you really don't have to worry about that like on uh, on a seawall or um, you know near the dunes or just in an area that it can really take off um, with full sun and uh, sandy soil it would it would really appreciate that all right so this is a fun one that I don't see used very often. Um, it's Ambrosia hispida or coastal Ambrosia. Um, it has a nice kind of unique foliage to it. Uh, those leaves, they kind of reminded me of like the scented geraniums and, and things like that. It, you can see how thick the stem gets down at the base. Um, this is a plant that again, has a bit of an aggressive growing habit, but if you have an area that is light foot traffic and um, you really just want something on the ground to kind of take over. Uh, this coastal ambrosia is a great plant for that. It's moderately salt tolerant. Um, I've seen a customer use it on uh, a canal and not have any issues with it for years. Um, but it is one that is listed as, as moderately. But it loves those dry and sandy soils. Um, it, it will kind of tap in. All these plants, you know, these ground covers, when they grow like this with that rhizome above ground, it's going to usually root right at the leaf node where it sends out those leaves at. So that's one way to kind of control it. But um, I didn't find that this one was as aggressive at putting its roots in as some of the others tend to be. Um, we just recently had to remove a planting of this that had been overcome by torpedo grass. So um, we had to pull it all up and then attack the torpedo grass underneath. And uh, I found that it came up easier than 
Sunshine Mimosa has in the past and Railroad Vine as well. Um, but really just kind of a unique little foliage to it. Um, can get a, a bad name because it is in the ragweed family, so ambrosia. So uh, a lot of people attribute um, allergies to that, and you may have ragweed allergies. If so, this may not be the ground cover for you. But it does provide a nice kind of uh, tone uh, as far as the color goes in the leaves, as well as texture in the landscape. All right. So here we have river sage or salvia macella. Um, you can see these showy little blue flowers that it gets. Uh, this one is a ground cover that can take a little bit of foot traffic. Oftentimes, like the frog fruit, I've seen this pop up in lawns that may be more of a patchy kind of a hay uh, type lawn. Um, and they can take a little bit more shade um, than a lot of the other ground covers. They even can be mowed if it's worked in with that um, setting. You can weed eat it if, you, if you'd like to, but oftentimes when we have it in a planting and wildflower beds, we usually just maintain it by hand. Um, it does have a nice fragrant foliage like all the salvias do, um, and it's actually a, a host to the fulvous hair streak, um, so the butterfly host plant basically. And you'll see these little blue showy flowers. Um, it's not very salt tolerant. Uh, this is this planting here is right near the Indian River. So, um, you know, it's not getting that direct ocean spray, but um, again, if you have an area in your yard you think could use this plant and you wanna test it out, sometimes the plants don't always read the books and, and you can get away with something that maybe uh, you didn't think you were able to. So it does like that sandy soil um, and overall just a, a nice little ground cover. All right, so here we have the blue-eyed grass. Um, blue-eyed grass is one that, you know, again, it can be kind of mixed in with other ground covers or turfs. Um, oftentimes you see it growing in embankments towards canals mainland, um, like the ditches you would see on the sides of the road. Um, usually you'll start seeing them bloom in about January, and then by February, the county comes and mows them down again. Um, but it's one that the pollinators do like. It has that nice little blue showy flower. I've even noticed that more, uh, I guess you'd say, conventional landscapers that aren't using native plants readily uh, tend to pick this one out sometimes and, and use it in landscapes near uh, walkways and things because it has a nice tight growth habit to it. And if you look at the base of the plant, it almost folds out like an iris would. It's like a small little iris. So um, for some reason, I, I, I guess they gravitate towards that. Instead of using like a liriope or a mondo grass, this is a great alternative for that. Um, but you can mix it in as a ground cover as well. It can get roughly about, you know, nine inches to a foot tall if unkept. Um, it's soil versatile. So like I said, you can see it on, on the banks of the ditches and uh, you can see it on kind of some high and dry areas as well. So these are some wildflower options um, that like the blue eyed grass, you know, I don't know that I'd plant like a whole lawn of, of this stuff, but it's good plants that, you know, might be able to mix in with your other ground covers. So you just kind of have that nice green blanket eventually. Um, a lot of these reseed readily. So you'll find that, you know, your mother plant ended up putting out a lot of babies throughout the yard, um, which isn't a bad thing. You know, we want to encourage the plants that readily reseed that are the right plants for our area. So the right native plants, essentially. Um, so it's not a bad thing if we do have spider warts reseeding within the yard, et cetera. So you can see this picture here. This is spider wart, Tratoscantia ohiensis. Um, but I listed some others that we like using as well, the wild petunia, uh, wild violet, and the lyre leaf sage. Um, so yeah, those are just a couple extras that you can work in wildflower beds as well as kind of ground cover settings. All right, I wanna talk a little bit about wildflower beds. So, you know, ground covers are great, um, but again, you know, you're kind of implementing a monoculture essentially, even if that monoculture does provide a lot more benefits to native pollinators. Um, it's nice to have variety, more diversity you have in your uh, landscape, the more diverse diversity of wildlife and pollinators that you'd bring in. So um, having more 
wildflowers is definitely not a bad thing. And as you can see across the street in this picture, I mean, it's all grass and probably like an exora or something over there. So th this house across the street is not bringing in nearly the wildlife that this little bed is here. So, um, you know, just creating habitat, bringing in more pollinators, more birds, more butterflies. Um, and it's a great alternative to kind of what you see across the street that, that uh, lawn. So after establishment, I usually say uh, to customers about two weeks of hand watering. Um, and usually from there, the wildflowers and smaller plants will be established. Um, but you never know, uh, depending on the weather in Florida, it's not always a guarantee. So, but it's very minimal maintenance. Uh, I find that the hardest part about maintaining wildflower beds for customers, um, which is something we help out with, is being able to identify the wildflowers when they reseed. So being able to notice, okay, this is a red sage seedling versus a nuts edge seedling. So I should pull this or is this red sage seedling too close to where the driveway is, et cetera. So just being able to maintain that wildflower garden in a way that is functional for you and um, functional for the pollinators. And there's a ton of wildflowers out there, you guys. I'm just gonna talk about a handful that we like using that I know are readily available in our local native nurseries. Um, but there's really a whole world out there full of plants that you know we can tap into. And some of which may not be readily available and, and put on the market, grown on the market like that, but um, these ones will be. So if uh, you look at Natescape or Maple Street nur Nursery or My Butterfly, they should carry some of these. In aesthetic value, I mean, this is a lot prettier than the lawn that you would see across the street, in my opinion. All right, so this is a classic uh, blanket flower, Gallardia pachella. Um, this is a wildflower that there's several Gallardia species throughout the US. Um, you see this as a wildflower into Texas, um, all the way up to, I'd say, probably about the Carolinas. Um, has that low mounding habit. So it doesn't get maybe more than about two feet tall max, but it can get about the same width to it. Uh, definitely a pollinator favorite. You'll see that uh, there's a variety of different pollinators on the plant at one time. Um, it's soil versatile, but it does prefer a little bit more of a sandy soil. Um, I'd say that's probably the the correct statement there. Um, you'll see these things growing in the cracks of the road on A1A. So, I mean, they really don't need a lot of tender care and nurturing. Um, and they're very salt tolerant. So, uh, this is a plant that, you know, you can use in the landscape. It's a um, long-lived annual, I would say, but it reseeds readily. So, um, you'll have another crop of blanket flower after the first one pretty quickly. And the, I believe both of these uh, pictures, these plants came from uh, Maple Street. And you'll see that because Maple Street grows from seed, there's going to be a little bit of genetic variability within the color structure of these flowers. Um, so even on one plant, you might find one with yellow center and uh, red petals on the outside or vice versa. So that's another thing about um, spreading genetic diversity within these seeds. Um, so we don't just have a, a monoculture of one genetic out there. All right, move on to the next one. Um, so uh, in a lot of these wildflowers that I'm gonna go over, I like to classify as space eaters. So they may not be you know, ideal ground covers for walking on, but if you just have an area that you really need to eat up some space, uh, blanket flower, dune sunflower are great choices. The dune sunflower is in the sun sunflower family, the Helianthus genus, um, Helianthus debilis. And uh, there's two, uh, subspecies of Helianthus debilis in the state of Florida. So if you are shopping at a native nursery on the West Coast, or um, you might want to pay attention to that because they classify them as East Coast and West Coast, with the West Coast being a little bit more, um, a little taller, a little bit bushier um, versus the East Coast in sunflower, which is a lot like a blanket, just kind of lays down flat. Again, this is one that's a pollinator's favorite. Um, you'll see a lot of different uh, types of pollinators grabbing toward, gravitating towards the pollen on this plant. It's got that low sprawling habit, loves a sandy soil. You'll see this 
uh, pop up beach side a lot. Um, it's naturally where it would occur. And, uh, but you can, you can get away with this if you live mainland as well, but it does like that sandy soil. So if you have um, a new, newly built home and it's a lot of that fill dirt and kind of like marly clay kind of soil, this isn't going to be your ideal specimen. Um, they would just, they can't take a wet foot like that. But a very salt tolerant plant, um, very tolerant of the sandy soils um, and overall a, a great space eater basically in full sun. So in this other picture, you can see some dune sunflower. This is mainland, so you can see it is doable. Um, and right next to that in focus is dotted horsemint or spotted horsemint or bee balm. Um, so Minarda punctata, this is another one like the Gallardia, the blanket flower that has several species throughout the United States. There's Minardas probably in every state, I would say, but Alaska, if I had to assume. Um, but the Minarda punctata is a beautiful little wildflower. It starts blooming towards the end of summer um, and into fall. Um, there's still probably blooming a few right about now, depending on when that plant was seeded. Um, it's an absolute pollinator magnet. So you'll find pollinators all over this thing when it's blooming. Um, has a really nice little flower to it though, if you really look closely at it. Um, I haven't tried it as a cut flower personally, but I imagine you might be able to get a, a couple days out of it. But really, I would leave it around for the pollinators. Um, it does have a fragrant foliage um, as well. It's kind of more of the uh, sagey kind of smell rather than a mint, but I believe it is in the mint family, Lamiaceae. Um, maybe someone can uh, figure that, Google that for me while you're uh, watching me, but beautiful blooms, uh, fragrant leaves. You can actually use this as a pot herb, um, so it's technically edible. Uh, you could dehydrate the, the leaves for teas. Um, we've actually done that before, but we haven't used them, so I, I wouldn't say I, that I can attest if they're great, but I'm sure if you mix it with something else like some lemongrass or at least a little sugar, you might be okay. Um, but I love dotted horsemen. It gets roughly about three to four feet high if you uh, if you let it. Um, you can trim it, but uh, these plants, you know, when they, they're kind of, this one's a longer lived annual, I guess you could say. I don't know if it's classified as perennial technically. Sometimes when you cut back after a bloom, it will refoliate on that original plant. Um, however, you might only get another season out of it. So um, I'd say short lived perennial, long lived annual but it's one that does reseed fairly readily too. So you will find it pop up in your garden elsewhere. Um, but yeah, roughly about like three to four feet tall, um, almost the same width to it as well. So it's, it's another one that's a space eater. It might not be crawling like your blanket flower or doing sunflower wood, but it's one that can definitely take up some space and bring in the pollinators. So here we have tick seed uh, or Coreopsis. This is our state wildflower. Um, Two species I know that are available uh, typically at Maple Street or uh, the Labenworthy um, in Floridana. Um, there's about 20 different species, might be more than 20 different species throughout the state of Florida. Um, this is one that it, it pops up in, in mowed areas a lot. Um, if there's like a retention pond or something like that, the seeds are so small on here. Um, I guess that hence the name tick seed. Um, they do reseed fairly readily. Um, it likes full sun, but it does prefer a moist soil, um, if you're able to provide that for the Coreopsis. Um, but a, another one that's great to bring in diversity of pollinators within the garden. Um, you know, all these plants, be great if you planted 20 dotted horsemen, you know, but it, it's, it's even better if you planted a variety of all these plants to bring in the different pollinators and butterflies and birds. The plant we have here on the right is a blazing star or gay feather, um, along with the Minarda and the Gallardia, uh, this Liatris spicata. The Liatris is a genus that uh, you can find species of throughout the United States as well. Um, the spicata actually uh, goes fairly far north, I believe up into Tennessee. Um, in Mississippi State, where I went to school, this is one of the first plants we used in plant propagation class uh, because it's a corm. So uh, it's all its energy is stored underground, almost like a potato has a tuber. 
the Liatris has a corm, um, and bananas actually have a corm too underground. So this corm is basically the energy source for this plant. And in areas where, like in North Florida or Georgia, where it might freeze over, um, this plant will go completely dormant and just hold on to its energy within that corm and sprout back up come spring. Um, and you are able to divide it from the corm, but typically it's propagated through seed after these beautiful purple blooms are done for the year. Um, typically you're gonna see this bloom um, and kind of like the Minarda, about the end of summer into fall um, is when you start to see the blazing stars bloom. Um, it's listed as not very salt tolerant, uh, but this, this is planted on a canal um, in Cocoa Beach and it's been doing fine for several years. Um, these blooms, the bloom stalks on them can reach about five feet. So if you're planting this, uh, you might want to keep in mind wherever you do cut that flower spike before it starts blooming, it may get a chance to refoliate and rehead. And from there, you might have uh, a couple of flower spikes on that one bloom stalk. So, um, but if it's already in full bloom like this, it, it won't do much good. Um, but just keep that in mind with planting and spacing where you put these wildflowers, you might not want that um, blazing star too close to where you walk through every day. This one's pretty close, but no issues thus far. And this, this particular species, the spicata, um, it's listed that it would like a wet soil versus a dry soil. This is a fairly sandy soil that it's planted in here, uh, but it does have that nice mulch layer on top to hold in some of that moisture. Uh, but if you do source these plants uh, locally, you might find that uh, Liatris gracilis may be available and that species can handle a little bit more of a, a dry foot. All right, so another one that sends up a nice big spike or a uh, bloom stalk is the seaside goldenrod, Solidago sempervirens. Um, you can see these bloom stalks are upwards of six to seven feet. Um, and this is, in this picture, you can see in this case, we had done a little bit of pruning early on to where there's multiple stalks on, on one uh, throughout here. So it kind of thickens it up a little bit. Um, this is an absolute pollinator magnet. If you're trying to bring in pollinators and only want to plant one plant, I would highly suggest this or the Minarda punctata, the dotted horseman. Um, these blooms are starting to open right now. Some are open uh, depending on the location. And again, when that plant was seeded, because um, a lot of these plants have determinate lifespans or uh, just certain life cycles that they try to keep up with with the seasons. So, uh, and again, these blooms can reach about eight feet when they're ready to flower. Uh, the Solidago genus, again, like the Liatris and like the Minarda, is a large genus. And actually there's, um, I won't get into it, but uh, taxonomists, plant taxonomists have recently recategorize some of the solidagos in the Midwest um, into a separate genus. But um, around here, you might find the Chapman's goldenrod uh, or the seaside goldenrod. Um, and there's, there's probably a few others as well. Um, just depending on the area of the state that you're in would depend on which would be the specific to your bioregion. So um, this is right on the Indian River Lagoon. So um, it's in a nice sandy location, but it can be a little bit more soil versatile if it was um, in an area that was a little bit wetter, it would be okay. But usually you find the Chapman's goldenrod growing in the uh, boggier areas versus the seaside. Full sun to shade, I have seen it do okay in the shade. Um, you won't get quite as robust of a clump as you might get in the full sun, but it definitely does fine. Oh, and this one is mistakenly attributed to allergies. So we had mentioned the Ambrosia hispida, the coastal ambrosia, um, being in the family of ragweed. Oftentimes when you even mention goldenrod, folks bring up allergies, um, and there are no allergens that are produced through solidago. So um, keep that in mind if you want to tell that to your friends. All right, so, you know, we talked about using some different plants and things, but uh, one thing I like to talk about as well is the right use of uh, aggregates within the landscape. So um, this yard, this is all three pictures are from the same yard. This was all turf. And instead of doing turf all the way around their pool, um, we went, if I go back, we went with 
a washed shell um, for the pathways and a flagstone and a pine bark within the bed. So um, it's important to use permeable uh, aggregates for your pathways um, up against the house and things. Um, just the more drainage typically the better um, because if you think again we're all connected to that watershed so if the water just beads right off eventually it's going to land somewhere we don't need it. So um, some of the aggregates that we like to use would be like the wash shell that you see here. We use crushed coquina which is more of that kind of gold look to it. Um, gravel, lime rock and then with the mulches we tend to try to stay with the pine products so um, pine bark nuggets, whether that's a mini really fine pine bark or a really nice big and chunky. Uh, I, I'd classify this as kind of a mix um, of large and small pine barks. Um, mainly we like to use those because they're not dyed um, and they're basically a byproduct of the mulch industry or of the pine industry. So when these trees are harvested for lumber, uh, that, by, that pine bark is uh, sorted and used for, for mulch products. So um, we also use pine straw. Uh, the thing about using pine straw versus pine bark is that pine straw's lifespan is significantly lower. Um, we've seen pine bark last upwards of about three to five years in beds, whereas that pine straw it could break down within about six to nine months. Uh, but you know, if you think about that from a different standpoint, we want to build up our soil in some regards. So adding more organic matter to it and having your mulch decompose a little more quickly isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's just how often do you want to reapply it? Um, how much do you really want to build up your soil? Kind of some questions to ask, but anything that's processed and dyed, um, you know, they're not using anything nice and nice to the lagoon uh, usually it's red dyes number five or whatever you may have so when it rains it really rinses that mulch out that dye will wash down your driveway and go into the gutter on its way to the lagoon so uh, just some things to think about there <clears throat> and i just wanted to show you guys a couple of pictures of some yards that have uh, reduced their amount of turf and are, are lagoon friendly customers so here we originally had a nice big St. Augustine lawn that we ended up um, cutting up and, and converting it to more of a uh, shell kind of yard. So since this picture was taken in the top left, um, we've, we've added some more. We've added a trellis with coral honeysuckle and uh, some things like that. And it's kind of hard to see in the shade, but there's fiddlewood, Elliot's love grass, uh, red sage, um, some of the more shade loving uh, wildflowers, I believe we had some Stokes Aster in there as well. Um, and in this top right, you can see uh, the neighbor's lawn versus some of the sunshine mimosa that's starting to take off. The, the tone of green really isn't that much different than, you know, the neighbor's lawn wants to be. This is the green that it probably should be. Um, but so that mimosa can substitute as a, a turf, you know, in a lot of cases. This job was more of a uh, kind of wildflower bed. So we set up several beds throughout the front yard. Um, you can see on the bottom right, it was all turf grass, kind of more of a mixed lawn. Um, and we removed everything that was in here and added everything from uh, red mulberry, fakahatchee grasses, firebush, cocoa plum, tons of wildflowers, blanket flower, uh, golden rods, um, uh, a lot of good stuff, so. This is one we did a lot um, fairly recently. So you can see in this picture and in this picture, it was mostly all uh, kind of this white lime rock throughout the yard. Um, so we ended up scooping out a couple tons of that lime rock um, and going with a chunkier pine bark nugget and oh, probably about 35 species of native plants on this job particular. So all the way from large royal palms down to twin flowers and and river sage and things like that. So um, there's not really like one way to do it. It's all about your yard, what's functional to you, what would you like to see, and um, how much habitat would you like to support basically. So um, there's definitely good things about just adding one native plant, but the more we can add to our yards, the more we can help uh, with the habitat. So 
In conclusion, um, you know, reducing turf is going to be a positive impact on the lagoon. It's going to be a positive impact on your wallet and for habitat um, you're going to be creating within your own yard. Um, so if you are going to look into reducing your amount of turf, try to use native plants and ground covers. Again, this list was just the tip of the iceberg. Um, feel free to reach out to myself or um, any of our FNPS members um, and, and let us help you out. And uh, if there's anything else, you know, please feel free to contact the number down below. And we'd love to love to talk to you about what's going on in your yard. That is now I know are you hearing me? Okay, yeah, I'm hearing you. I, what, what was that, Carol? I was just thanking you for a great presentation. Oh, thank and, you. Uh, you know, we had just some uh, people saying how nice the pictures looked, and that was uh, really nice, and you really did some great detail on each one. Um, I appreciate it. Let's see. I have a question coming in from Stuart. Um you mentioned earlier that you had to remove a planting bed to remove the torpedo grass. Yes. And wondering how you remove torpedo grass so it does not return. By hand, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so the torpedo grass is the bane of our existence, basically. It, um, those rhizomes are below ground um, and they're gonna be anywhere from an inch to 12 inches below ground. Um, the sandier soils, it's easier to dig out, but at the same time, your, your hands are going to hurt at the end of the day. So, um, there, uh, there's really no way of completely eradicating it. Unfortunately, it will grow under sidewalks or, um, you know, embankments and things. And, uh, I find that it doesn't usually come in via like mower blades, like some of the other, um, noxious weeds might, um, it's really just climbing underground through that rhizome. So if you have it, it's just something that you kind of have to deal with. And unfortunately I do in my yard. So I feel your pain, Stuart. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, when I first moved here, it was um, just a clean plate and boy, I dug down deep and I got some patches gone, but, uh, mm -hmm. but those, uh, some of the plants that you mentioned are in my yard and I'm so happy for that. So yeah. Yeah. With the torpedo grass, I mean, sometimes there, there's no fun day when we're pulling torpedo grass. So we try to make it fun just to see if who can have that longest spaghetti noodle that we can pull out of the ground and see how long it can get. Um, I think our record's right at about five feet. So oh my gosh. Um, wow. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Skip. We really appreciate your information and knowledge. And I do see someone else. Awesome presentation. And uh, they're going to call you for consolation. So this is all good. Um, good deal. Awesome. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for uh, having me. And, you know, we, we love to be able to talk to folks that are interested in native plants. Uh, I've given this talk to um, garden clubs and things like that. And oftentimes, you know, I have to, I have to preach a little bit more about the native plants where with this group, I feel like, you know, everybody's kind of already on that mindset and just interested in, in knowing a little more. So, um, yeah, feel free to reach out for any consultations. Um, we offer design services, installations, and then we offer wildflower maintenance as well. So. Very good. Very good. Plants don't stop growing and it's not like, um, you know, there's there's not going to be weeds, never any more weeds when we put in our native plants. So, yep. yeah. All right, Skip. Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you. I want to thank everybody for watching us and um, please stay tuned for, um, let's see, somebody has a question about separating the seaside goldenrod. Separating it? You, you could, it? yeah, because at the base, at the base of the plant, it sends up these these basal leaves and uh, B A S A L leaves, um, and you could separate a clump if you needed to, but it's it reseeds very readily from from that seed. So uh, sometimes what we'll do in our wildflower maintenance accounts, if we just would like to see a plant more productive in another area, we'll just take the seed head if it's still on the plant and just drop it or just kind of shake it in an area that we'd like to see it sprout up. If 
that doesn't work, you can always try reseeding it or seeding it within like a seed tray and uh, potting soil. Um, but they're, they're, you could divide them if you really had enough roots on the bottom of them. Um, I'd say maybe just when you divide them, pot them up into some pots first until they establish and then you can replant them within the landscape. Excellent. I, uh, I of it first is to shake them out and yeah, because in its natural state, it's not like somebody came along and dug a little hole and put them in over these 500 years of <laughs> native plants. That's right. Yeah. All right. Fantastic. Um, we got that last question in. I've heard a lot of people really compliment you, Skip, and we really appreciate it. Um, thank you. And all we can do is thank everybody for watching us and hopefully soon um, it'll be next Monday, excuse me, Monday, December 14th is our next meeting and we hope to have you join then. So we just want to tell you to plant native. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody.